Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is John Hill. I am the evangelist at TechSars. It's a fancy term for storyteller. I, I have the good fortune of speaking on behalf of the organization all over the world. Um, so within tech conferences, uh, within ecosystems and at universities. Um, really been on the university roadshow lately. I have spoken at eight universities in the last two weeks, and uh, I will do 41 from January 1st to end of May. Um, so keeping me a little bit busy, which is fantastic, but I happen to be home. And if you've been on more than one of these before, you know that that's a rarity. And uh, so this is actually what my house looks like in the background uh, for all of you. And uh, today we're here for Techstars Accelerator Partners Pathway to Success. So talk about how startups can engage with corporate partners. Um, we're looking at this through the lens of the Workforce Development Program. And uh, we're very fortunate to have some guests on here who are going to share their uh, expertise. But I'll start by setting up the person who is going to be running that program, Dave. Uh, Dave Cass, why don't you pop on and you can intro our guests and we'll go from there. Thanks, John. Thanks for setting this up. I appreciate having it. Uh, I would be going on and off a of mute. I'm at South by Southwest EDU right now. I'm meeting with founders all day, so I have a lot of background noise. Uh, but I am the uh, the managing director of the Workforce Development Program. This is the this is the second chapter of the program, and our goal is singular. We want to we want to invest in and support. Uh, the strongest impact founders that are focused on the maximization of human potential, whether that's through education um, or work, and uh, we will do everything we can to support those founders. We also have a few great partners that you'll get to meet here very soon that are that are helping us do just that. So uh, let's jump to Zana. Hi, everybody. Um, most people call me Zana. Full name is Zana Augustine. I am with World Education Services, the Mariam Asefa Fund there. And we are a nonprofit social enterprise that has existed for almost 50 years, 50 years this year, actually. And it is a fully self-funded nonprofit that generates revenue through our core business in credential evaluation services for internationally trained professionals moving to the US and Canada. And so essentially what that means is that we operate both in the US and Canada, but also have a global reach. And uh, we have a philanthropic body, but also an investment body that funds both nonprofits and startups, um, but applies an equity centered approach to our work. And so super excited to be here with Techstars to share that experience and um, glad to share the space with you all. All right, Mike, you're, we, we've saved you for last. I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, everyone, thank you for taking the time. Nice to meet you all. Uh, Mike Canigan, I'm with Strata Education Foundation. So Strata is a nonprofit uh, with the mission statement of creating clearer, more purposeful pathways between education and employment, specifically post-secondary education and employment. Uh, pretty large nonprofit that does that in a multitude of ways. So we have a research arm. We have a policy and advocacy arm, philanthropy and grant-making arm. We own a few other nonprofits that exist as semi-autonomous units under the larger umbrella. Uh, and I'm biased, but I would say the fun part is strategic investing. So that's why I'm on the call today. So we have kind of a dual strategy there. On one hand, we make direct investments into companies that further upwards mobility for underserved Americans. So anywhere from pre-seed up through Series B, uh, we'll look at that. A uh, little less pertinent for you know this call because the other side of the house is we make fund manager commitments, uh, such as to the TechStars Workforce Development Accelerator. So Strata's thesis there is we don't believe that there's enough capital available to founders within the space. Um, and so we try to inject capital at every step of the capital continuum so that founders have as much access to funding as possible. So uh, on the early stage, that's stuff like this, the Workforce Development Accelerator, uh, all the way up through buyout funds and everything in between. So uh, yeah, appreciate you all being on the call and look forward to the conversation. Yeah, and Mike, I would say the funding is definitely pertinent to all this, all the people here. <laughs> so, yeah, certainly. Uh, Dave, um, I've actually spoken at South by twice, so uh, South by EDU twice, and South by regular twice. So, I've got four times there, and I'm not there this year, which I'm glad that you're carrying the flag for us. Um, but uh, let's start with uh, something simple. Uh, and for everybody here, I have a background in career development. I worked at Michigan State University, internship and experiential opportunities. Uh, I worked at LinkedIn, so I love professional career development, mobility of uh, opportunity through careers or education. 
Uh, and I uh, will start with kind of a, a very broad uh, conversation, and then we'll try to bring this down a little bit to specific expertise that Zana and Mike can bring to the table. So for both of you, um, talk about, um, at a minimum, your organization's experiences with working with startups, or you specifically working with startups, how that uh, looks like. And you've touched a little bit on it, uh, but we can go a little bit deeper. Yeah, I, I can kick it off. Um, so Strata, like I said, pretty multifaceted organization. So depending on what part of the organization you're talking about, the answer is a little bit different. Um, on our research side, uh, there's some interfacing with startups, uh, philanthropy and grant making. There's certainly a lot of startups that play a process in that. Um, but I would say, like I said, we have a direct investment portfolio of 40 companies um, spanning very large stages at this point. We've been investing for over 10 years. So everything from pre-seed companies up through uh, you know, very, very late stage companies. So, I mean, I think that Strata... The benefit we have as investors is kind of twofold. One, uh, the easy answer is the connections we have to uh, universities and to employers. And that's the, the really easy answer. I think where we wind up providing the most value, though, is just the wealth of knowledge that exists within the organization and the ability to plug people within our organization into conversations with founders and startups uh, that are especially pertinent to that specific startup. So if you're selling to universities, there are people at Strata who were former presidents of universities. If you're selling to uh, employers, there's former CHROs of Fortune 500 companies. If you're selling to government, there's people who were high up in the Obama administration and, and kind of so much more. So I think we try to plug in and be as helpful with startups in whatever way makes the most sense for that specific startup, um, but winds up being very, very multifaceted uh, on how we go about it. Zana? Thanks. Yeah. Um, so we use investments and grants often blended to advance West's mission. And we currently have over 100 grantee and investee partners across our portfolio um, over, I think, yeah, about like two, three years now. And so we do this through four uh, core funding pillars, uh, opportunity, power, wealth and justice. And for example, through this partnership with Techstars, we're sort of looking to fall under the bucket of opportunity. Um, in efforts to find and fund solutions that create workforce opportunities, especially for some of the target communities that West focuses on, which is uh, immigrants and communities of color. And so um, at the same time, we're also finding this as a window to create opportunities for migrant founders and founders of color who don't typically have access to or the social capital provided uh, by, the net by a network like Techstars. And so when we're working with our investing partners, we're actually looking beyond the check to support them beyond the check and build a sort of like trust based relationship through um, uh, investment processes that are very participatory, involved, um, engaging and um, really focus on the success of the founder and the ecosystem that they thrive in. Perfect. And uh, for all, we've hit 110 people viewing this currently, so we've got a pretty good group. Uh, in front of us. Um, for all those people who are on, please ask questions. Um, go into the Q&A area. We're going to take questions at the end of this. Um, in chat, feel free to say where you're at um, and uh, what your company does. We'll take a peek at it. Uh, I end up working with about 10 to 15 of our tech stars companies a little bit deeper than uh, normal that are in the ed tech and in the workforce development space. So um, I would love to see who's on here as well. Uh, and feel free to connect with me uh, as you go. So um, let's start with, and Zana, you actually touched on it uh, a little bit, what your goals are, um, but broaden it out uh, on what you would like to see as success with a relationship like this um, for Wes. Yeah, so we're looking to expand our impact here. So not, I mean, not only collaborating with um, an organization like Strata Education, but with tech, tech Stars as well, um, we're looking at impact from an influence standpoint, impact on the founders and impact on the clients that the ventures would be serving. And so in the past, we've partnered with other accelerators and have seen how our participation influences the selection and mentoring processes. For example, uh, making founders more satisfied. So we're hoping to see the same, um, if not better results with Techstars, considering uh, you know, Techstars is a high performing accelerator. And um, success to us actually just looks like very satisfied founders, well-supported ventures, um, a resourceful community around um, the founders that they can rely on, trust, 
Um, also looking for a very well represented and diverse cohort that, um, that can add value to their peers, peer learning, um, and some other outputs. So, I mean, I think typically success to us just prioritizes the founder, but also the ecosystem that um, will be created. Sounds great. Reflect the same thing to you, Mike. Yeah, I mean, I, I echo many of the same sentiments. I think that um, a, the goal for us really is to help founders and companies get off the ground and succeed that maybe otherwise would not. Um, I touched on it a bit earlier in that, you know, we do invest in funds kind of across the capital spectrum, but I think there's a really big gap at the pre-seed stage. I don't think there's a lot of funding options for founders as they're really early in their journey. There are what feels like a million funds that are doing seed investing or growth equity and, you know, obviously on your way to private equity. Um, but I think Strata and, and myself, candidly, have recognized that there's just not a lot of opportunity for funding for these early stage founders. Um, so I think a success to us, one, is getting, like I said, these companies off the ground that otherwise may not. Um, but also being able to do it in an environment like Techstars, where not only do you help them get off the ground just from a capital perspective, but also you're able to give them kind of hold their hand give them go-to-market expertise, connect them with mentors, connect them with potential customers and just make them that much more spun up on uh, their business. So yeah, kind of all of that combined, I would say, is what makes uh, makes it a success in our head. So both of you represent unbelievable organizations in what they do to impact a uh, global environment. And I, one of the things that, so I do a talk called Power the Network where I help uh, people navigate relational capital uh, for funding, talent, customer acquisition, knowledge share, mentorship. And uh, it's super interesting for me that startups struggle engaging with corporates because you seem so big and you, you, you're you borderline intimidating. So let's bring this down a little bit and talk about uh, how um, companies can best uh, approach you um, and some of the successes that you've seen with uh, entrepreneurs, innovators, engaging with your organizations, especially at like that seed stage level, early level. Yeah. I mean, I would say, I would start by saying you don't get what you don't ask for. Um, I think that, um, you know, something I always tell founders is you should be doing as much due diligence on the people who are investing with you and the people you're working with as the investors are doing on you. Um, and I think that that echoes a lot as you start thinking about working with corporate partners is, you know, Strata is a large organization. And I, you know, I selfishly think I'm pretty tapped in across, but there are things that are happening at Strata that I'm not aware of. Um, and there are things happening at West that Zana is not aware of. And so I think, um, you know, coming into a program like this, as Strata's hands-on, as West is hands-on, we will do our best we physically can to connect you with everyone at Strata or West that makes sense. Um, but it is your responsibility as a founder to do the best for yourself, to look at are there opportunities or people at Strata that make sense that you have not been connected to or at West that you know makes sense to be connected to that you have not been connected to. So like I said, I, I really think it comes back to you don't get what you don't ask for um, and you don't know what to ask for unless you're doing your research and doing kind of your own due diligence. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, Zana, um, just before I hand it over to you, I want to appreciate Holly O'Brien for being the first person to ask a question on here so far. So you were the leader, Holly. Go ahead, Zana. Yeah, I'll um, I'll agree with Mike. I think um, just to echo what he said, transparency and vulnerability is should be your your approach. I think when you're working with like organizations like Strata West, um, it's very easy to be transparent and vulnerable as opposed to like some other really intimidating uh, corporate uh, partners. And so um, I think that's one thing. And then as a corporate partner being on the other side, I think applying a very, um, I mean, this is just what Wes believes in, applying a, applying a very like trust-based uh, approach to relationship building. At the end of the day, you're connecting with a human and so build a relationship and allow, I guess, the founder and the team to be able to build a relationship with you just for sustainability, longevity, um, support, um, success. Uh, I would say treat it as like, you know, a friendship or a, a romantic partner or something, you know, like something very personal. Um, yeah, vulnerability, transparency, um, just so that we're not like intimidating anybody. <laughs> 
John, just as a validation to the question, I really appreciate Zan and Mike's answers. Multiple uh, founders asked me the question today in my meetings. If we were to get into Techstars work for some, would we get to talk to Wes and Strata? Um, so there is that intimidation in, in the belief that there is this distance. Um, we'll have closed that, that gap, and, I, and I'm going to I'm going to give the founders Mike and Zan his home number. I, I, I okay. <laughs> so I'll let Mike and Zana uh, negotiate that with you, Dave. Um, for um, Mike and Zana, I, I generally talk about um, some of the research we've done with mentors in the past and how it correlates with engagement with corporates. And so what we found, I was in charge of the Global Mentor Network for a number of years, and we surveyed our mentors heavily, and they said that the four major reasons that they mentor with tech stars, specifically tech stars, one was altruism, so they just wanted to get back. Uh, number two, they were interested in technological trends. So our companies gave them a view of what the world looked like two to five years from now. Number three, they were interested in their own opportunities, board work, advisory work, um, jobs, C-level positions at the companies. And number four, they were interested in qualified deal flow. So if you get to know the companies and you know the product and service, you can marry those together and make an educated ask on um, the development side. That second one, though, is the I think the secret to the two of you. If I come to the table giving you something in the process, instead of starting with trying to take something, it builds what you were talking about, which is the genuine relationship. And the insights that some of these companies have, they're tip of the spear. Like they're doing things that you haven't thought of yet. Um, and so thumbs up if that seems like a good approach to be kind of moving people towards. Perfect. Great. All right. So um, what should uh, startups know about engaging with you? Um, you know, we've kind of talked a little bit about, uh, you know, why you're engaging with them. Um, but what should be the expectations on their end? Zana, we can start with you. Yeah, I'll say Wes is just not like a traditional funder at all. And so I think back to the point that I had before, just like be vulnerable, transparent, be honest. Um, uh, we're pretty open. Our team is pretty flexible, always open to like, you know, in meeting new people. And so whatever you've experienced in venture or any other kind of like traditional funding stream, Wes is not that. We're innovative, friendly, open. Um, supportive. And even if we're not like funding you, I think Wes still like tries and aims to be a resource within, within the e broader ecosystem. And so, um, yeah, that's just our principle and value. Yeah, so, uh, what, one thing I would layer in on that, Zana, I'm guessing that um, you have a lot of engagement and connection to ecosystem. And so one of the things that uh, potentially companies could expect engaging with you if they ended up in workforce development is the opportunity to tap into some of the ecosystems that you do, do deep work in. Exactly. So proof of concept, you know, development of relationships, whatever yeah. uh, within those areas. Yeah. Mike, how about yourself? Yeah, no, again, I'll echo a lot of what Zana said. I think um, you as a founder have to understand the investors that you're putting on the, your cap table and what their goals are. Um, so when you think about Strata and Wes, we really are uh, of the impact investor category. We lean way more impact than a lot of the people who say they are impact investors. Um, there are a lot of standalone venture funds that raise because they are impact investment firms, um, but really they care about returns first and impact second. Um, organizations like Strata and Wes really are more of a 50-50 and I think provide much more patient capital because of that. Um, and to Zana's point, you know, immediately before this call, I got off a call with a founder who uh, we for we will probably not wind up investing in. And he asked me, you know, would you still help me connect me with some people, even though you're not investing? My answer was obviously yes, um, but that's not, that's because we work at Strata um, and, you know, Wes accordingly. So I think understanding uh, who's on your cap table and who you're working with, like Zana said, we care so much about impact that whether we wind up making an investment or not, if there's some value add that we can provide that can make the ecosystem as a whole better, we're going to do it, whether you're within our portfolio or not. So I feel the two of you agreeing a lot. So I'm going to shake things up a little bit. And I'm going to have Mike ask Zana a question. Any question pertaining to startups or entrepreneurs. And Zana, I'm going to have you do the same thing. So Mike, Mike's at a disadvantage here. Okay, this should be fun. Yeah, yeah no. So um, 
for context, this is Techstars Workforce Development Accelerator has existed for the last three years. This is kind of the second iteration of it. Internally, we are dubbing it Techstars Workforce Development Accelerator 2.0 um, because there's always room to get better. Um, I would be curious about, and for context, this is Wes's first time around supporting the program. Um, I would be curious what moved the needle the most for you guys to want to participate in this program versus maybe another accelerator, a venture studio, or just another opportunity with the capital? Yeah, I think, I mean, we obviously know like Techstars is great. Um, truth be told, I think it's like an impact. I think back to my original point, Wes is very equity centered in everything that we do. And I think, I mean, obviously Techstars is as well, but the opportunity, I think, to influence workforce um, with the specific like demographics that West focuses on, which is migrant communities, communities of color. And so being able to sort of like shift the outcomes and change syst systems, workforce systems um, with those particular demographics, because that's something we don't typically see considering that they're all, you know, underrepresented and really that's where the, the change happens. And so, I mean, it's not it's not guaranteed that in the next three years we're gonna achieve that change, but I think it's it's a start. It's we're we're excited to see what solutions come out um, by focusing on those specific demographics. So the snippet coming out of here is Sana saying Techstars is great. That was what she started with, right? So we know what social is gonna do now. Sana, ask Mike a question. Mike, I'm curious about, um, so we've had some back-end conversations. What's a KPI that we've discussed that you're excited to see? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I'll tell you the one that I, wow, there's a couple. I think, um, so I kind of said what a goal for Strata is, is companies coming out of this accelerator and succeeding, uh, whatever the definition of success is, they persist and they continue to exist that maybe otherwise would not if they had not had both our funding as well as our handholding. So I think the KPI, uh, you would probably get a different answer from every single person on the Strata team. Um, the one that moves the needle the most for me is as we look three years, five years, et cetera, out, how many of these companies still exist? How many were acquired? How many raised more money? Um, because to me, like I said, I, I really think you know, part of the job is to talk to startup founders all day long um, from pre-seed up through you know pretty late stage. And I think founders, as they get later stage, it's a lot easier for them to get capital and um, it's harder at the beginning. So I love the fact that this accelerator gives a much needed bump to some companies that may not have existed if not for that bump. So I think you know, a very down the line metric, but uh, three years out, how many of these companies are still, still existing um, and thriving ideally is really uh, what moves the needle the most for me. So for the record, yeah. um, Mike, Zana, I think both of you will agree uh, as a moderator trying to hit a specific narrative on something like this, nobody would generally cede control of the questioning to two partners who had not discussed the questions ahead of time, right? But that worked perfectly. So that might be the only time I ever do this for the rest of my career, because <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna exceed that. That was fantastic. So um, let's again take it down a notch and uh, talk about some of the characteristics. Um, talk about the type, uh, you know, the kind of founders that you'll view as successful in engagement with a program like this, or, or I guess from a corporate perspective or a, a global organization, uh, what successful founders look like that are um, uh, good at navigating organizations like yours? Yeah, yeah, I can kick it off. Um, I think one of the most important things in founders that are successful is lived experience uh, and really just kind of founder market fit within whatever space they're building. Um, you know, there's, I've seen a lot of startups, but if you put me in the CEO role in almost any of them, I probably wouldn't succeed because I'm probably not a great founder market fit for almost all of them. So, um, you know, lived experience is really, really valuable. And then I think versatility, like anyone who's a founder on this call understands there's a lot of ups and downs that goes into being the start, uh, founder of a startup. Um, and a healthy level of skepticism as well. Uh, and, and honestly, a healthy level of just confidence. Um, 
because you're going at it. You might have a co-founder, you might not. Um, but in the early stages, you're really kind of going at it alone, even if you're just going at it with one other co-founder. So I think a conglomerate of all of those things. But I think the thing I would come back to the most is just lived experience and the reason that you are the right founder to be building this product or this service um, and understanding that your strengths lend itself to you building this company versus someone else. Zana? Yeah, Mike took everything I was going to say, but um, I'll just add, I think somebody that's a really good learner, um, we don't, I, I think we don't expect you to know everything except of course the work that you're doing, um, but somebody like open-minded, willing to learn, adaptable, and I think as well um, can influence, I think to Mike's point, confidence can build a team, um, bring people along that journey just, you know, for impact and success and all of that. So um, a good learner, adaptable and influence. So we're back to agreement between the two of you. We might have to go back to what we did before. We and decided to fund the same program. For a reason. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love it. Uh, so um, let's, we have 21 questions. It's going to be tough to get through 21 questions in 30 minutes. So I want to shift over to that direction because I think it would be great for you to have some conversation with the people who are attending this. Um, but before we get there, are there any points that you would like to kind of talk about with this program, engaging with uh, corporate partners, global organizations, uh, any typical advice you give to startups and entrepreneurs? Like I'll leave it intentionally broad, but I want to make sure that if there's a slice of messaging we haven't touched, either both of you have an opportunity to kind of share with that. Uh, Mike, you nodded your head, so I'm going to start with you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I would just highlight, you know, this is an impact oriented accelerator program. Um, many of them are not, uh, whether you're looking at just within tech stores or you know, other accelerated programs broadly. Um, this accelerated program is put together by uh, you know, foundations like Strata and like West that really have impact at the forefront. And so um, I think that's just something to know as you're building an impact oriented company. I think it lends just itself really well to being in a program like this um, because you're going to get people who are really, really bought in to the mission of what you're building. And also, um, I think what's unique about our programming is we're going to help you build kind of impact measurement tools and way to think about impact as you're building your business. Um, whereas in a lot of other accelerators, that may not be the case. So uh, I just think it's exciting to be a part of an accelerator that cares so much about impact because there are not that that many of them. So, uh, yeah. Donna? Of course, we are partners. So I am in agreement and was going to say impact. Um, but with that sense, I think you don't necessarily have to be an organization that I think uh, you know primarily focuses on impact. I think if you want to be a part of this program, um, there's, I think, openness to um, learn how to, you know, adapt uh, new impact metrics for, for your business. And so I do love the fact that we're very impact centered, impact oriented. Um, but again, like this is open to anybody who is looking to learn as well. So, yeah. So Zana, Mike, we're going to try to go through 23 questions in 29 minutes, which is borderline impossible. So what we'll do is I'll ask the question. One of you come off mic and, you know, you can raise your finger and say, I'll take this uh, and answer the question and we'll go to the next one and we'll keep going through. So that way we'll try to get through as many as possible. Uh, Dave, you and I can also jump in on some of these as we see them that are pertinent to kind of our side of the Techstars equation. So let's start with the first question. Um, and I, I love this because this is, already thinking about like, how do you operate the give and take within engagement of a corporate or a global entity? In negotiation scenarios, achieving a balance where both success and failure outcomes are equally considered is crucial. However, this becomes challenging when dealing with partnerships between startups, which typically uh, can offer limited resources and large corporations, which have substantial resources to offer. What strategies or approaches can be employed to equ uh, equitably balance these disparities in negotiations involving potential partnerships between startups and large corporations? Mike, you can take that one. <laughs> yeah. That was yeah. great. I mean, I think it's tough. I think, you know, whether you're talking about a startup working with a startup or a startup working with a corporate partner, 
or just kind of a relationship in life, oftentimes things are not completely equal. And I think um, you have to go into conversations understanding that and understanding what you want out of the partnership um, and adjusting expectations accordingly. So I think when you think about working with Strata, um, if we were to invest in you, like I, I kind of said it earlier, I think we would do our best to be as beneficial to you, but you also have a responsibility to uh, make us as beneficial to you as possible. So I think it, it's just really leveling expectations as much as you can at the beginning and then just adjusting accordingly. Good answer. Uh, so I have control of the levers, so I can point things in different directions. And I'm going to point it towards Dave Cass on this one and put him on the spot. Dave, uh, if we have figured out a strong business model but haven't raised funding yet and have an app with a strong debt, uh, should we try to raise funds and dilute? Uh, what are the odds of becoming a billion-dollar company provided you are a first-time founder? Go. Okay, the second part of that question, what are the odds of being a first-time founder, I cannot answer. I don't think that, that data point exists. Uh, but on the fundraising question, um, I'd want to ask the question back to the founder, uh, why, why are you raising this round? What is the goal? What is the outcome? And can we actually break it down to milestones? I think this goes back to, to Mike's answer too on any long-term partnership is that you have to identify early, mile, early milestones. Large companies, large investors have size and power and startups have agility. And that is really powerful. Um, that is really powerful too. So if, um, if those milestones are, are defined, um, we can measure success along the road and not at the end, not at the end of the road. So I don't think there's enough information on why the company is why the company is raising money. What is the use of funds, uh, and why, if they have tried to raise, why have they been unsuccessful? So I think I think there's a there's an area to dig in uh, with questions there. Yeah, and I would just jump, I would just jump in, Dave, and say raising venture isn't right for every company, um, and that's very counterintuitive to someone whose job is to be a venture capital investor, but. I think it's the best advice you can give a founder. Um, you can build scale and be an extremely successful company without raising venture capital um, or without raising debt. And I think uh, given the current kind of social media ecosystem, it's very easy to you know, get caught up in the noise and see people raising massive rounds and scaling really fast. That's not always right for your business. So to Dave's point, really understanding why are you raising capital is the biggest question, I think. And I don't uh, tag on my, I don't think it's the measure of success either, which sometimes happens in the startup community is I've raised X million dollars. That's success. Not yet. Yeah. Mike, to your point, um, when I get, uh, in front of startups, especially, um, early stage, first time startups, um, I generally will tell them, uh, you know, investors can't live without you. You can live without investors. And so like the similar thought process uh, with that approach. Um, so Dave, I'm going to ask you a favor. If you go into Q&A, you'll see some that are very like startup general uh, questions or tech search general questions. If you can just answer those live, it'll allow us to get to some that I think would be helpful for Zana and Mike. Um, so the next question I have is, um, is there any route to gain investors for a nonprofit ed tech startup? And I have answers for that, but I'm sure you do as well. Yes, yeah, Zana, I'll let you take that. Is there is there any route to gaining? To gain investors for a nonprofit ed tech startup. Um, I mean, uh, I mean, it's beyond just like referrals or contacts with the current funders that you're working with. I think that's how Wes at least works um it's a little bit of like pattern matching unfor unfortunately but at least like we are operating within a very like diverse ecosystem of uh funders that we work with and so we're pretty good at like passing passing on introductions and stuff so yeah i don't know if that was helpful i would just say it's a different category of kind of like investor um, so I think anytime you're looking to raise capital, whether you're for-profit, non-profit, or depending what stage you're at, you really have to understand the type of investor that makes the most sense for you. 
So, uh, you know, at that point, it would be someone like a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that would make sense as an investor because they have kind of unique forms of capital that they can deploy, as opposed to maybe your prototypical kind of venture investor. So there definitely is an avenue to raising uh, you know, funds. It's just a little less obvious than if you were a for-profit company. So, so John, that's the heart of this question. I'm wondering if uh, they were asked if there'd be nonprofits in this program. Uh, and unfortunately there, there's not. Uh, the 12 companies in this program will be for-profit. It's not that we don't want to support nonprofit. It's just the kinds of support are different. Uh, we want to offer a very specialized support to these 12 companies. So I think they, they um, Yanni, who uh, asked the question, uh, followed with, uh, I guess the question is, can a nonprofit take investors, technically, is what they were going for. So, all right. I, I love Paul put not only his name, but his company. Uh, Paul here, founder and CEO of Pay For Me app, just so everybody was aware, uh, where we provide instant cross-border payments, banking, and financial services for international students and immigrants. My question is, do you have any recommendations on how to streamline the partnership process with colleges and universities? And I'm also going to jump in on this because I've worked heavily with the universities in the past, but um, feel free. Who wants it? Yeah, I can take it. I mean, um, I feel like I'm, I'm just continually harping on the same, same thing, but I think as founders, just really doing your due diligence on the organizations you're working with. So Colleges are perhaps even more compartmentalized than uh, the government or more compartmentalized than Fortune 500 companies. I mean, they are silo, silo, siloed organizations. And, um, you know, the head of student success at University A has a completely different role and different responsibilities than the head of you know, student success at University B. So unfortunately, it's you know sales may seem uh, harder because you really have to understand each university individually. Um, so I think really the takeaway is to just as you start having conversations with the, each university, kind of mapping out um, what those different silos are and what who the decision makers are, what the different uh, kind of groups are. But it's 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 tough. Universities are tough. Um, John, I would be curious your yeah. Yeah, so long uh, lead time for sales. Uh, a lot of times consen consensus decision-making. Um, actually, most times consensus decision-making. Really hard to find decision-maker, to your point, Mike, different role, same person, different university, right? Um, one, one of the things I love about universities, though, is historically they've been legacy users of systems. So once you get in, um, you have high retention. Um, so work to get in. Uh, and they borrow from each other very heavily. And a lot of it's driven by word of mouth. So if you're a good player with one university, it opens up the door for another university. I'll give you an example. One of the primary conferences in higher education is called the Council for Advancement in Support of Education. Uh, the secondary acronym for that is Copy and Steal Everything. So um, just so you're aware, like as you start to figure out how to work into the universities, um, you can leverage the relationships you build with one university to get access to others. All right. So um, if we have a corporate benefits program and want to explain it to HR people at big companies, how do we find them? How do we contact them? Probably easier to um, work with somebody that you know who knows somebody at the company, I would say. Um, corporates are pretty, they're not as bureaucratic as um, I think John mentioned, I, Mike mentioned before about like schools um but typically like referrals are really good uh when it comes to business partnerships and especially working with hr policies and all of that so i would say find a contact um and if you're working with an investor see if they have a contact and can provide that resource for you all right so um, this is an interesting one because I'm curious which one of you will take this uh, because I think you can both answer it. Uh, and I think you would answer it differently. So like that's what's fascinating about this. Uh, I've been told by many investors that startups selling to serving workforce boards and American job centers are not ideal channels for many reasons like regulation, sales cycle, et cetera. Considering they serve the most vulnerable segments of the labor market, can you speak to your relationship with workforce agencies and how you can support the startup serving this customer segment? 
Yeah, I can take the first stab at that. Um, I will say the strategic investments arm at Strata is not the arm at Strata that has the most relationships with workforce agencies and workforce boards um, and states and chambers of commerce. Uh, but I think the benefit of organizations like Strata and West are that if we were to invest in company A, there's a lot of people that at Strata that do have those relationships. And that's why I think it makes sense to take on investment capital from you know, a foundation like us is that we have all of those connections at our fingertips. It's just kind of one message away. So to Zana's point on the last question is, you know, referrals are gold. Um, I think that's kind of uh that's the answer but i you know to get back to the first part of the question i do think it's unfortunate that a lot of investors will look at companies that are selling into that space as not sexy enough to invest um and i don't agree with that i think there's you know, a massive market opportunity if you're selling into or working with those organizations um but yeah Okay, so I'm going to answer a couple live uh, real quick. Do you invest in startups that are based in the UK? Yes, uh, we are global um, in the uh, companies that we look at. Um, so there are certainly uh, companies that could come from, you know, most of most parts of the world. Um, and then, do you provide mentors that could help with strategic direction, but not necessarily provide investment? Um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, part, part of this is um, supporting the various areas of building a company. Here's the thing. We know founders are fallible. You're imperfect, which is one of the reasons you're on this call right now. And you have to fill the bucket. And one of those ways you can fill the bucket in learning in various areas of company building is through mentorship. Um, and I would say everybody on this call has benefited from mentorship at some point. I'm speaking for two people that I've met very briefly but uh, I assume pretty much all of us have been a, benefited from mentorship at some point. It's the same thing with your company. All right. So another question, what do you uh, look for in founders and is there a best way to pitch your organizations? And we've touched on nuances of this, but I think that's a very succinct question. Yeah, we're a catalytic funder. So pretty much early stage uh, founder that comes with like lived experience um and knows what they're they're talking about working on um we prioritize leaders who are proximate leaders so have direct relation to the communities and the experiences of the problems that they're trying to solve um and i think i mentioned like some of our demographics so west prioritizes um migrant founders but also um founders of color and so if you're solving issues, especially like within the space workforce, what issues are you solving specific to like migrants and communities communities of color within the workforce space? That's what we're interested in. Um, how to pitch us? I mean, I'm here. Um, I'm sure they're, they'll, they'll share my email at some point, but um, my colleagues Smitha and Matias are also available. I think they're open to like LinkedIn messages. You can find us anywhere, so. I actually will um, posit that back to both Mike and Zana. If you want to put your contact information in, feel free to do it. It's you. Uh, I for all uh, connecting with me, um, X Threads, uh, Instagram. I'm at Techstars John. Uh, connect with me there. We can you can DM me in any of those environments, and you'll get response. So yeah, and the the one thing I would add, just a general fundraising tip that I think has been beneficial to me, which probably means it's more it's beneficial to investors broadly, um, is increasingly obviously everyone knows as they're talking to investors, you know, you send your PowerPoint or your pitch deck. Increasingly, founders are writing up kind of a short form FAQ or a short investment memo. Um, there's so many questions, there's so many things that you can put very well in a paragraph that you can't put very well on a pitch deck. Um, and if you can send an investor kind of a combination of a pitch deck, and even if it's just five FAQ questions with your written out answer, it makes us so much more spun up on your business on that first conversation. Um, and it, it does somewhat stand out. I would say it's becoming increasingly common, but it really shows that you kind of went above and beyond, which is obviously always appreciated. So, so I there's a formula that I absolutely adore called Kiss. Keep it simple. And Mike, you just essentially articulated that. That was great. Um, what can we do to create a highly unique uh, well-being proposition for a healthcare brand? Um, 
Dave, I actually think you should answer that one. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's interesting as, as I was looking at uh, at founders uh, and then they're doing health and wellness solutions. The thread that ties together many of the, the companies and founders are looking at, again, are at this maximization of human potential. Who are the people that they are impacting? And initially, I wasn't too sure about healthcare solutions, but um, as I got to know Wes and, and Strider, we realized that everyone planning their, their career, their education pathway is not alone. And there's, there's a level of support required along the way. And once a person is in a career, let's, let's assume they're an employee of some kind, it is the organization often have the responsibility to support the health and wellness of, of, their, um, of their team, of their employees. So for this program in particular, again, focusing on the, the maximization of human potential, how are organizations supporting their employees when they're in place? Not necessarily a healthcare solution, but are they providing uh, are they providing that level of support, whether it's health, wellness? Um, we invested in a company in the first class that was uh, focused on reinventing and making maternity and paternity leave better for the employee. Uh, so I'm looking at it from a supportive lens uh, from the from the employer. So I love that Arthur uh, got on and said, hey, somebody please mute. It was actually Dave <laughs> in the background. <laughs> That's amazing, Arthur. Uh, so no, no worries, my friend. I thought that was funny. Um, I'm being quieter than usual, intentionally. <laughs> so uh, are there specific communities, and it's uh, in quotes, geographies, that your organizations are more ready to work with right now? And I think both of you should answer that one. Yeah, I think my answer is a little bit more simple, so I can go first. Uh, Strata really primarily focuses on the U.S. Um, we'll look at working with companies that are domiciled in Canada or work in Canada and are somewhat flexible in Mexico. Um, but in our mission statement, we're pretty explicit about the United States. So, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, just given Wes's mission, we're migrants, um, refugees, international students, communities of color, and uh, work both in the U.S. and Canada, but um, have also participated in accelerators that allow us to be global as well. So um, I think primarily U.S., Canada, immigrants, refugees, international students, communities of color. Okay, I'm going to back off the Q&A for a little bit because uh, I don't think we're going to get through all the questions, but uh, I do want um, for each of you, uh, and we'll throw Dave in here uh, as well, um, what's one word top of mind in your head right now? One word. Excited is my Excited. Innovative. Resilient. I'll throw in cool. So I don't know why, but that just popped in my head. So, um, Let's uh, go back to um, for both uh, your organizations, for Strata and West, um, talk about what your excitement is with workforce development, um, this program going forward. Any generalities you want to touch on? Great. And I know we've covered a lot through this uh, time period, um, but uh, anything you're thinking in regard to your two organizations in this partnership? I mean, I think for West, we're like a new partner, a, a new partner in this accelerator, which is exciting already. I think there's lots to learn. Um, but I think the intersection of like the demographics that we care about, which is immigrant founders, immigrant communities, as well as well as uh, founders of color and communities of color, just to see like what comes up within the workforce space, which I think is unique, uh, probably unique for tech stars as well um and seeing what our participation is going to do to tech stars in terms of like their processes and how they manage the group and what the outcomes are going to be and then also just looking forward to the trajectories of whoever gets selected especially like underrepresented founders um just giving given some of the successes of tech stars in the past how is that going to change with wes's unique participation Yeah, um, you know, the, the 
similar in that like excitement um, because we've been partners with the accelerator before. So um, I don't know if this it's this way for all tech stars programs, but for us, the first time around was kind of a three year commitment. Um, we went back to the drawing board and wanted definitely wanted to continue and obviously are, um, but tried to figure out how we could make the accelerator better um, and how we just across the board could be a better accelerator to the founders themselves and the companies themselves. So I think it was a really healthy process of kind of self-improvement and self-assessment. So I'm excited to take some of those actionable takeaways and put them into action. Um, and then also having a new partner like Wes is really exciting. Um, I think it, it narrows uh, the program a little bit, um, you know, refugees, immigrant founders, like this is all, these are things that are a little bit more important now that Wes is at the table. And I think that's really exciting. And then another partner who's just really bought into the mission is, is never a bad thing. So, yeah. So the title of this webinar was Techstars Accelerator Partners Pathways to Success. Name one pathway to success for a startup with each of your organizations. Uh, be proximate to the community. Like let the founders be proximate to the communities that they're serving. Because that way you, you, you have a clear understanding of the problem that you're trying to solve. And it's personal too. Sorry. Yeah. No, you're good. Um, yeah, I would say comparison is the thief of joy. Focus on building uh, your company and being successful in your own right. And um, we will find you. Um, you know, I think that's the unique thing about investors is I, I really like how you said it earlier, John, investors can't exist without startups, but startups can't exist without investors. Um, and if you just put your head down and succeed and grow, um, we, you will be found by us because our job is to find you. So, yeah. So one of the things I love about startups is they have this audacity to, um, dream big. Like they have this uncanny ability to suspend disbelief and do something that nobody else in the world has done or do it better. Um, that's a gift. And I know everybody on this call appreciates that gift. Um, when you're a managing director, when you're running a program, um, even more important because, you know, your relationship, your connection to those companies is going to last invariably a lifetime. So Dave, I don't want to leave you out of this, even though you will have noise in the background, uh, share some of your thoughts on, or at least one pathway to success. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think uh, as we work with these partners, think about what we can all do together. And it, a lot of it surrounds knowledge and network. And I'll double down on the lived experience that Zana has mentioned a, a few times this call. Um, that lived experience is a strength. Uh, and that's why we look for it in our investment thesis, that uh, any adversity you face in your life is a strength. That's why I said resilience, because it's what we're looking for in founders. Mike said earlier that he um, uh, looking for confidence. And I want to add that uh, something I'm looking at when I'm talking to founders is a vulnerable confidence. Every founder is struggling in some way. And I'm more worried about the founder that I talk to that says everything is going great. Uh, so I'm, I'm really, really uh, very inspired by founders who you get the sense they can go through any wall you put in front of them. If you put new information in front of them, they'll stop, take it in, learn, and maybe even adjust their path. So uh, uh, I'm with you, Mike, on confidence, but a vulnerable confidence where they'll come and actually share what they're struggling with. Because as a managing director of this program, I actually want to focus more on those primarily on what you're struggling with. I'll give you a high five on your successes and celebrate with you, but I, I want to lean into where you're struggling. And that, that's the goal of our of our whole team. And that's the goal of the Techstars network and the network of uh, Wes and Strata as well. There are three networks here that are combining in a powerful way. Thank you, Dave, and please mute. Uh, so um, just kidding, my friend. Uh, there are our um, some tools that I just want to make sure everybody is aware of that they have access to. So if you go to techstars.com, you can view what it's like to go through the application process uh, as a founder. So you can see what it's like to go through the experience uh, of that approach. Um, we're here to help you in that process. Um, we want to view your companies. So uh, please take a look at techstars.com, reach out if you have questions. Uh, we've also built a toolkit that can afford you insights on how to build the respective parts of your company. So if you go to toolkit.techstars.com, 
Um, we've made video tutorials of every category of the build a company you may need as kind of foundational knowledge. It is really good stuff. I was part of the team that helped put that together. Uh, and we actually did it for universities and university uh, student startups originally, um, but found it was beneficial for everybody. And we just updated in 2024 um, venturedeals.techstars.com, which will showcase the insights of uh, an investor um, telling you how to pitch them. So the reverse pitch information from the investors that have invested in Techstars companies. So really good stuff for all of you to associate with. Uh, we're coming up into our last couple of minutes, um, but for all of you left in chat, if you can help uh, thank Wes and Strata for coming on here, and particularly Zana and Mike for representing those organizations. Um, that would be awesome. Um, for Zana and Mike, when you are doing something like this, you have no idea where it's going to go. And uh, this hour flowed so quickly that it just felt kind of seamless. Um, so incredible appreciation for uh, both your candor and uh, and your thoughtfulness on the uh, ways you answered those questions. Because uh, at, at the end of the day, we're all here to help startups. And um, and we know those startups uh, afford an opportunity for a better future. And so it's great to be able to do something like this and support some of the people who spent time with us. And then anybody who views this recording, uh, having the ability to go back through this and see the thoughtfulness of your answers um, in each stage. So I uh, appreciate the two of you. Dave, thanks for pulling me in uh, on this. Uh, for all those people doing the behind the scenes on behalf of Techstars, you're amazing as always. And uh, we will let you get back at your day and your build of company. So thank you so much.